English like that? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah? Okay. Uh, no. No? Is this What? Is this your yeah. Uh, that's my hand. Oh, don't worry. Uh, okay, I think I have to give it back to race. Uh, Ox and ham? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to. Uh, okay, race. Very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, thank you ever so much for letting me uh, speak at your bar camp. I must admit, this is the first time I've ever attended this form of conference in a bar, I think it's a great idea, uh, perhaps not this end of the night where we've all had a few, whatever. So um, as I was introduced, my name is Rhys Oxenham, uh, I work at Red Hat, as you can probably guess, uh, I work in the virtualization business unit as a field product manager specifically focused on OpenStack and Red Hat Enterprise virtualization. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about OpenStack of course, uh, but I really want this to be more of an interactive session. Um, if there's any questions you have, please just scream out at me. If there's anything you really want to go into specifically, then that would be fantastic. Um, Do you need please. a microphone? A microphone or am I okay? Yeah? yeah. Microphone? Okay. Is this better? Yeah. Excellent. So as I said, if there's anything you want me to go into specifically, please just raise your hand and we can, we can go ahead and do that. Um, also, people are telling me to. I think it would be uh, useful if you could uh, speak a little bit slower. Yeah, I've already been uh, told this. Uh, <laughs> my colleague is also telling me slow down. It's uh, a really bad habit of mine to just keep talking very, very quickly. So I guess we should probably make a start. So I'm going to start off the presentation just by sort of asking you guys, what's the big problem, right? We've been doing IT for a number of years, and you know, whilst we're seeing new architecture changes, things are moving more towards the cloud, but really, where's the big problem? And I sort of see three major issues which we've sort of coming across. I'm not saying that these are all of the issues that we're seeing, but these are some of the major ones which help us introduce some of the OpenStack topics. What we're really starting to see is that we are, as a civilization, producing a lot of data. We keep doing this year on year, and the data is getting exponentially large. You know, we're, we're finding trouble, actually, how are we going to cope in the next few years about finding somewhere to place our data? Um, and what we're also seeing is that how we store and process this data is actually becoming very difficult. The traditional applications which we had and the systems that we choose to deploy these applications on uh, were going way beyond what these were originally designed to do. The second one is that the service requests that these applications receive, they just keep getting larger and larger. More and more people have mobile phones, have tablets, have internet access. We're really seeing the rate at which um, clients are trying to access the applications is growing exponentially as well. And what this boils down to is the third point on that display. Um, applications were never really originally written to really cope with this sort of demand. I think it was pretty unexpected. So what we find is that over the years, rather than deploying on top of physical systems, a lot of things have shifted towards virtualization. Right? We can pack a lot more virtual machines on top of a system to really drive up the utilization of that system. But that still leaves us in uh, a pretty big, big uh, predicament. And this leads us on to, you know, why should I care? Well, realistically, servers fail. We always know that servers are going to have issues. Now, there's quite an interesting statistic there. I can't take full credit for this, but um, I've got here. If you were to build an environment from scratch, um, you start off with the most reliable systems that you can find, and we've got here a 30-year mean time before failure, so the average time before failure of a reliable system could be 30 years, completely theoretical, you will watch one system fail every single day if you start off with 10,000 systems. So you really have to um, think about the way that you're deploying your applications. If the applications and the way that you've written them do not take into consideration the failure of the underlying application, you're really going to have to try and accommodate this. So this is really driving a new way of actually developing applications. And what we're going to see is a shift in the way that these applications are both written and deployed. 
And what am I talking about here? Well, we're talking about fault-tolerant software. Software that is aware that um, failure can happen, rather than aligning all of your applications directly to, say, one single system, uh, which is you know, the traditional way of writing an application and deploying it. We're introducing scale out. So rather than having one system representing your application, you may have tens or hundreds or even thousands of systems. Now the perfect example and the one I like to talk about quite a lot is Netflix. Right? Their application and the way that they deliver their content to you is not just via one system. Right? There's not just one system working its heart out to deliver movies and TV shows to you worldwide. This is represented by hundreds or hundreds of thousands of systems worldwide. So if, for example, you were to lose a data center or lose a, a rack of servers, the end client wouldn't necessarily realize this. And this is what we're talking about, this fundamental shift between both traditional workloads to these cloud-enabled workloads. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail, right? The traditional way that we've been building, building applications is what we call sort of stateful, right? If you want to achieve more throughput, um, you know, be able to transact more, more data, process more data, you tended to have to build bigger systems, right? More CPU, uh, more memory, more disk space, etc. But what we are really doing is relying on, say, I mean, I, I know I've got virtual, virtual machines here, but this could also be representative in physical hardware. But if we're talking about virtual machines specifically, uh, the applications themselves, because they're not aware of this possibility for failure, we have to rely on underlying technologies to make this a little bit better for us. For example, high availability, uh, DRS, and various other technologies. Um, so this new cloud type enabled workloads, um, this is where, as I say, it's not directly representative of one single system or maybe a few. We're talking about tens, hundreds, thousands of individual systems. If you want to add more capacity, you simply add more. They are stateless. They are aware that failure is a possibility. Or I sometimes put this uh, slide up. Uh, this is a sort of, uh, this came out from uh, um, Tim Bauer CERN. It's basically an easier way of thinking about it. You know, you may have your traditional applications and we can think of them as pets, right? If, for example, they get ill, they get sick, you want to make sure that they are nursed back to health, okay? We wrap them up in cotton wool and make sure they're all okay as quickly as possible. Whereas on the flip side, you've got this scale-out like architecture with farm animals. They all roughly do the same thing. If you want to, to produce more, you simply get more cows. Right? If, one, if one dies, it doesn't matter. It's just going to get replaced by another one. So you're probably thinking, you know, where am I going with this? Okay? Where does OpenStack fit into this conversation? Well, OpenStack is the sort of platform that really enables these types of workloads to be deployed and architected. Okay? It, pro it provides this elastic cloud infrastructure for these type of workloads to be deployed in an easy to consume fashion. So let's look at, you know, what is OpenStack? Well, um, just to, by a show of hands, who is really sort of familiar with OpenStack here? Okay, perfect. Uh, and you guys actually been deploying OpenStack in your respective organizations? Okay, perfect, okay. So what is OpenStack? Well, OpenStack is what we sort of coin as an OpenStack, uh, sorry, an open source operating, uh, cloud operating system, okay? It's a set of tools or components that comprise essentially of building blocks that allow you to form an infrastructure as a service cloud. Now, uh, OpenStack initially was modeled on the Amazon Web Services or the EC2 framework. So if you're familiar with the way that Amazon um, AWS or EC2 works, OpenStack is actually um, gives you the, the same sort of tools and the same building blocks that allow you to establish these clouds but behind your own firewall. So the project was initially started um, by two organizations, right? Um, NASA being one and Rackspace being the other. NASA were working on a lot of the compute, so you know, how do you get access to compute resources? And Rackspace were really concerned around the, uh, the, the object storage platform. Nowadays, OpenStack, as you're probably aware, you probably can't 
find a news article that doesn't mention OpenStack somewhere. Um, it's uh, obviously got a huge amount of hype around it, and um, it's actually now coming to fruition where we have uh, an independent foundation that drives OpenStack uh, forward. They decide on the new features and the way that uh, the, the direction of the project um, as a whole. Now, this is very much a vendor agnostic platform. It doesn't represent, uh, you know, one organization's views. It represents the community as a whole and where they want to go with it. Um, Red Hat is, of course, one of those uh, founding members of the OpenStack Foundation, but there are many other organizations represented there. Well, let's look at why the world needs OpenStack. I think we can all agree that um, the term cloud has various different meanings, um, but for the, the actual, you know, real definition of it, you know, the whole idea about providing um, elastic resource it, resources available by our self-service portal, um, this is really the sort of direction that a lot of compute and, uh, or, or at least computing, and the, the way that we deliver IT is going. Um, so OpenStack really does represent both the change from the, uh, the traditional workloads to a cloud-enabled workload, all the way forward to um, the way that uh, we're actually architecting our internal IT systems. Um, if you look at the likes of Amazon Web Services and how well they're doing in the organization, in, in, um, in the community, you can see that um, we've got this rogue IT happening, right, where it's much easier to circumvent your internal IT organizations. If you want to get access to a RHEL 6 server or a Windows 2008 server, it's very easy to take your credit card and sign up for an Amazon Web Services account. You get it instantly, okay, there's, there's lots of security considerations around that, but it's very easy to do that. Um, and so what we're really seeing is that these companies are really setting the benchmark about how IT can be delivered to you as a consumer. And so uh, IT organizations are really trying to match that or at least have this sort of functionality in-house. We've mentioned the way that applications are being built differently today. And OpenStack really represents a new type of architecture and the platform that you can build these types of applications on top of. Just look at some of the uh, typical use cases and what I'm seeing as um, where OpenStack is really sort of starting to be uh, picked up on. First of all, as a service provider offering. So if you want to become the next Amazon Web Services or Rackspace, uh, maybe you're a telecoms provider and you're looking at reselling some of your compute, your storage and networking services out to end clients or your customers, then using a platform like OpenStack kind of gets you over 90% of the way there. Um, there's a lot of tools and like I said, the building blocks that allow you to establish this all with this self-service front end so that your, your users can consume it very, very easily. The second one we're seeing is just an internal cloud, um, sort of like a, an infrastructure on-demand type service. Uh, again, um, I mentioned the example where it's much easier to, to take your credit card and consume resources from Amazon. If we were able to have that same level of flexibility and agility in-house, that makes it a very lucrative platform to use and to provide to your internal customers. Sort of along these lines, we also see, um, obviously, there's big test and development environments internally in, in, in your, your organizations. And for a large portion of this is actually built on top of the same types of platforms that you'd have for production. Maybe you have a VMware estate or a Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization estate, and it would make sense to uh, maybe improve the way that your IT is delivered, uh, cut costs, for example. You could do this with OpenStack, and this is definitely an area which we're seeing more and more interest in. The third one then is um, if you wanted to create one of these new type applications, you look at the likes of where Netflix, eBay, PayPal, uh, how they have a, a, a huge amount of stateless virtual machines that they run. If they want to increase the capacity, they can add new machines. OpenStack is a great place to start in a greenfield environment, so you can continually add more nodes and more capacity to your end clients. But just to try and dispel some myths, OpenStack is definitely not a replacement for enterprise virtualization. I think in the community and uh, you know, around the world, what we're seeing is that OpenStack is seen as the next generation cloud platform. And whilst that is true, 
a lot of people are considering, well, we want to move away from VMware or um, maybe some of the other enterprise virtualization platforms, and we want to adopt OpenStack. But they're trying to put the pet type workloads, right? So the stateful type workloads, which require things like high availability and DRS, and they want to use that on top of OpenStack. And realistically, it's not the type of platform that you would deploy these pet-like workloads on. That's not to say it wouldn't work. I mean, you could put your Oracle database server on top of OpenStack if you wanted to, but it just doesn't provide you with the same levels of, um, you know, like I said, high availability, dynamic resource scheduling that you may want to, uh, to keep on top of those traditional platforms. Any questions so far? Am I talking too fast? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it's not in Polish. You're absolutely right. Okay, so we're going to go into um, some of um, the OpenStack technical details, how it fits together, what the individual components are. Like I said, scream out if you want to ask anything. So what you may not be aware of is that OpenStack is now actually on its eighth major release. Um, it's been out a number of years, and the Grizzly release, which was released, um, I think it was April of last year. Um, am I right in that? Yeah, April of last year. This was the first platform which we saw some real enterprise adoption, where customers were really looking at OpenStack to provide that next generation architecture for their applications. Um, we saw a significant amount of, uh, of, of take up. It's, it took a few years, but it's certainly getting there. And this number, of, or the, the number of organizations adopting OpenStack continues to grow. Last month we released Havana, um, and in another six months we're going to go on to release the next uh, Ice House release, which is every six months. <coughs> Just some brief statistics um, on where the, uh, the, open, uh, the open source and the OpenStack community has, has gone. So we've got over 13,700 code commits. So this is a significant number within six months. You can really see the adoption rate picking up. So 31% over Grizzly. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, another one is uh, 400 new features across all components. So uh, as I said, OpenStack is made up of a number of different components. And the number of new features that go into this continues to increase uh, rapidly. So I always put this picture up just to uh, get a bit of a laugh. Um, <laughs> just, just to sort of explain that OpenStack is a very sort of complex um, architecture, all different components integrated in various different means. And I'm in no way going to explain all of this in the short amount of time that I've got with you this evening. Um, maybe that one is a little bit easier to, uh, to consume. So OpenStack is basically made up of these various different components. Each of them works autonomously, so it works you know, on its own, uh, but also when you pull them all together, you can actually provide uh, a very feature-rich cloud platform. So it's based on an ever-growing set of individual components. It's all based on Linux, and um, just like the applications that it's designed to run, it is designed to vastly scale out. If you want, for example, uh, more compute resources, it's easy to just add more of, well in this case, more of the Nova elements into your, into your cloud uh, environment just to gain more compute resource. So let's look at some of these individually. Uh, so the first one is Keystone. So Keystone is the authorization or authentication store for OpenStack. Its main responsibility is for um, storing the users, the roles, i.e. what they can do in, internally within, within your environment. Uh, and, uh, back more crucially, to what projects or tenants that they belong to. So you can, pro you can sort of think of a tenant as uh, you know, maybe a, a group of users or, or maybe a, a customer if you're reselling access to your environment. Um, so Keystone really does become an integral part of your OpenStack environment because every action that you try and do with an OpenStack has to go via Keystone. If you want to start a virtual machine, it asks Keystone whether you, as a user, are allowed to do that. So every component interacts directly with Keystone to verify your actions. In addition to this, it provides a catalog. So basically, this is a catalog of all the different services the Europe Stack environment uh, caters for. So to use OpenStack as a whole, you only ever need to know how to, how to access Keystone. Keystone will then essentially broker your communication to the rest of the components. 
OpenStack Nova, so um, undoubtedly this is probably one of the most important components of, uh, of OpenStack. It's basically responsible for managing the life cycle of an instance. Note that I use the term instance and not virtual machine. This is because OpenStack um, has the ability to both start virtual machines on top of, say, a KVM hypervisor, a VMware hypervisor, Hyper-V, but also things like Linux containers or Docker containers or even bare metal machines. So we don't use the term virtual machine explicitly, we just coin the term um, instance. Glance, so if for example you've got um, a template or a, uh, an image of a virtual machine that you want to boot up, Glance's responsibility is to provide uh, both the storage of that, in of that image and a mechanism for retrieving it. So um, you, know, you may have a RHEL 6 template with all of your patches and all of your corporate applications on top of it. Rather than having to kickstart or um, install from scratch every time you want to have a RHEL 6 box, a template gets you most of the way there. So when it starts up, you can have access to this environment very, very quickly. It supports a wide variety of formats, all of the typical ones you, you, you find in some of your traditional virtualization environments, which makes it very easy to adopt an OpenStack platform, pulling some of your existing images out. Uh, Swift, which is the object store. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Amazon's S3 platform, it's actually very similar. So it's just a RESTful, HTTP-based uh, object storage platform, built in replication, resilience, uh, fault tolerance, uh, things like that. OpenStack Neutron, so uh, Neutron is OpenStack's networking as a service layer. Uh, what this actually does is provides you with an API to define what your networking infrastructure would look like within your individual tenants. So you as a user, you can define and manage all of the networks that you want to as part of, of, of your environment and uh, Neutron will then implement those via a plugin. So what we do in uh, Red Hat OpenStack is we use Open vSwitch, but if you're using, say, VMware, you could make use of some of the NICERA plugins to actually implement these networks. But Neutron basically provides this abstract or logical representation of what your networks look like. So are those only providers those that are mentioned in the, on this, on this slide? No, uh, these, these ones are just examples. There's, okay. there's a whole host, I think, I think we're up to about nine fully supported yeah. uh, in the community. Um, plugins, but these are just some examples. Um, just, just on that note, OpenStack is really providing um, a framework rather than an actual implementation. So Nova or Neutron doesn't actually implement networks, it just stores a, a logical representation and relies on underlying drivers and plugins to actually do the implementation itself. So in this case, Neutron would just be storing the network information. So IP addresses, MAC addresses, um, you know, uh, firewall rules and things like that that actually rely on a driver or a plugin like Open vSwitch or NICERA to implement these networks. Next one is uh, Cinder. So this is uh, OpenStack's block storage as a service, similar to Amazon's EBS. So um, sometimes you may want to have uh, access to a block device as part of your, uh, your, your running instances. Um, so this basically provides an abstraction layer between um, maybe you've got a back-end SAN or you've got maybe a cluster file system somewhere and you, you just want to attach block devices to your instances, maybe for um, resilience or maybe you want to have uh, access to tier storage. This is the abstraction layer that you go about doing it. The next two components are actually brand new to the Havana release. Um, they became fully supported. Um, the first one is Heat. This is OpenStack's orchestration layer. This allows you to define what we call application stacks. So if you have a, a typical um, repeatable deployment, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, say, uh, two web servers and a database as um, a, a stack that you want to typically continue to deploy in a repeatable fashion, uh, OpenStack Heat provides you with that interface to do so. So you can upload or um, copy in a template based uh, or written in YAML um, and it will go away and build that and manage all of the interlinking dependencies. Now these dependencies could be pretty much anything. They could be as basic as two virtual or three virtual machines. 
They could then go on to the firewall rules that link in between all the different instances to get started, any block devices, etc., etc. And these sort of allow you to manage um, all of those machines and all of those dependencies as one collection. So, Solometer is the next component that uh, became fully supported in Havana. So, Solometer is OpenStack's billing and metering system. Um, of course, this is one of the most crucial components when you are you know, creating a cloud that you want to actually bill your customers. So, this will allow you to uh, decide on the metrics that you want to, to look into and actually collect data on. Maybe that's a case of how many CPU hours has someone used, how, many, how much bandwidth has uh, as a user consumed. You can charge on what you want and then scrape that, uh, that data out to actually charge, charge your customers accordingly. Finally, that takes us to um, OpenStack Horizon. So Horizon is um, a self-service portal for both users and administrators of OpenStack. So you don't actually have to use Horizon. Um, you can just use the, the native APIs or the command line interfaces to uh, interact with an OpenStack environment. But Horizon basically makes this a lot easier. It's actually a self-service portal for you to start instances, control your volumes, look into your networks, configure them as you see fit. You may be thinking, you know, how do I get started um, with, with OpenStack? Now, um, I promise this isn't a, a Red Hat pitch. I may work for Red Hat, but uh, I'm not trying to push anything on you guys. Um, I just want to make a, a mention that it's actually very easy to adopt OpenStack. Um, so uh, Red Hat has uh, an enterprise version of OpenStack, but we also have a community release. If you're familiar with the way that we package up Red Hat Enterprise Linux from Fedora, this is very similar format. We call this RDO, it's basically a, um, a, a, an open source, upstream community version of OpenStack that we package up directly for Red Hat or Red Hat compatible operating systems. So the likes of uh, RHEL, CentOS, Scientific Linux and, and Fedora of course. Now as part of this offering, it comes with a multi-node installer. So traditionally one of the hardest things to do was to actually uh, install and configure OpenStack. Uh, there's lots of different components and they all have their own configuration difficulties, shall we say. And so this actually makes it a lot easier to actually get started with OpenStack. So here's the thing to do, openstack.redhat.com and follow the quick start guide. So um, what's next in OpenStack? Well, we're currently now building um, the Icehouse release, um, which is uh, set to uh, become available in roughly five or six months uh, in, in April of next year. And um, the way that we introduce new components, new sort of sub-components of OpenStack, is they sort of get selected um, by the OpenStack Foundation, and they can go, if they get accepted, into this incubator status. And so the incubator status basically means that in, say, six to 12 months, they will become fully supported components of OpenStack. So you'll see this list become, you know, larger and larger as, uh, as the years go by, where new products or new features or, or new subcomponents uh, get introduced into the community and they want to get adopted um, you know, by some of the, the uh, people actually deploying OpenStack. So we have the likes of, uh, we've got Trove there, which is database as a service. So rather than you having to install a database manually after you requested a virtual machine or an instance, this will actually pre-configure everything for you. Ironic, so this is the, the Nova bare metal support. When I discussed earlier, um, about the different types of instances you can have. There may be a case where actually you don't want a virtual machine, you don't want a Linux container, you want a full bare metal machine for your purposes. OpenStack will be, ha will be having this, uh, this available to you. Um, this is currently in what we call te technology preview mode, um, so it's going to be a case of um, in around about six months we should have this fully supported in the product. Um, Marconi, so this is uh, just a message bus as a service, one of the things that uh, people are still screaming out for. Uh, and then Savannah, so um, actually automating Hadoop deployments on top of an OpenStack. One of the additional com complex things to do with an OpenStack is upgrade between major versions. For the, just for the, the rate at which OpenStack changes, the new innovation that happens, the new components, the changes between the major releases becomes very difficult. Uh, one of the things that is becoming a lot easier is how you move 
from, say, Grizzly to Havana, and then Havana to Ice House. So this is becoming a lot easier. And actually moving today from a Grizzly-based OpenStack deployment to a Havana one is uh, a lot more straightforward than it has been in the future. It's sorry, in the past. And the final two things I wanted to mention then was um, the AAA and the Tusker stuff. So um, we've really sort of touched on how do you deploy, manage, and configure virtual machines or instances as they are in OpenStack. What about how do you deploy the underlying infrastructure, right? How do you define, um, you may have a, a set of server acts, how do you define which servers are going to do what, what purpose? If we, if we take a look at all the different components as I put them up earlier, you may have 10 machines dedicated for storage and then you may have I don't know, 20 machines dedicated for compute. How do you actually manage the deployment, the upgrading, the configuring of the OpenStack services, and how do you manage that on you know, such a large scale? Some of the, uh, the Tusker and the Triple O stuff is bringing that next generation management layer of both uh, monitoring your OpenStack cloud as a whole and how you do the installation, configuration, and ongoing maintenance of that cloud. Um, so that sort of takes me to the end of the slides that I had. Um, were there any questions so far? You said that uh, OpenStack supports uh, different virtualization platforms. Uh, yes. VM, VMware, but can you have a part of your infrastructure based on KVM, another part on VMware at one time? Um, not within the same sort of cluster. Mm -hmm. um, because it sort of takes you to com complexities with things like networking and things. Um, it is possible to have it in the same open, open stack infrastructure, uh, but you have to sort of isolate it in some ways from the other ones. Would anybody be interested in actually seeing a demo of what this looks like? Sure. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. No? Just me. Yeah, okay, excellent. Right, right. So, um, what you're seeing here, this is um, the... Um, the landing page for um, Horizon, so the dashboard. Okay, um, this might get pretty difficult with me typing and clicking, but um, I'm just going to log in here. I've got a, uh, a user. Thank you very much. <laughs> Should really mirror the screen. Um, so this is the landing page. Um, you can see this is uh, this is just a Red Hat uh, version. Hence why it's got a bit of branding. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll just hold it. It's, it's fine. Yeah. But thank you anyway. Round of applause. <laughs> so um, I'm going to log into this. Uh, bear in mind, this is a live demo. I have virtual machines representing what my OpenStack infrastructure should look like. So if it breaks, don't blame me or Red Hat, please. Um, so this is this is the landing page when we log in. It basically shows this is Havana. This is the absolute bleeding edge latest release. This is currently a beta version of the Red Hat. Um, Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform version that we've got. So this basically gives you an overview about what's going on. Now, as you can see, my, my environment isn't doing very much. These are virtual machines based on my laptop, okay? So, um, you can't really see that very well, but basically we've got this menu on the left-hand side. Well, that's better. So we've got this menu on the left-hand side that allows us to dive into various different aspects of our OpenStack environment. So we always land end up on the overview page, and then the next one down we have this instances list. Now this will give us an overview about what's currently running within this tenant. So you may have multiple users that represent your tenant, okay? So they'll all see the same list um, of, of machines you have there. You see I'm not currently running any of these, these instances. So I can go up to the top right hand corner and say I want to launch an instance, okay? It's going to ask me a few different questions. For example, we have this concept of availability zones. Very similar to what Amazon have, we could maybe launch our instance in London, we could launch it in, uh, of course, Warsaw. Depending on where your availability zones are, you can really decide where they want to be. Um, so I'm going to give it a name, I'm going to say test one. Then you have this uh, flavor size. So flavors correspond to uh, how big this instance needs to be. For example, how many virtual CPUs? How much virtual memory, how much disk space do I want my instance to have? Now, as I said, as this is uh, on my laptop, I'm only going to select a tiny one. And the tiny one represents one virtual CPU, 40 gigs of disk, and 512 megs of RAM. Now, based on the limits, so the quota that my tenant has 
um, you can see how that fits in and whether it's even possible for me to launch all of those instances. If I was to, for example, change that to 100, you can see that I'm, I'm going to go way over my quotas. So I'm just going to say one for this. Now we have a few different options on where we or what we want to boot our instance from. If, for example, you've already got uh, a deployed um, machine that you've previously snapshotted, you can boot directly from that. It'll just clone the existing image. Um, if you want to boot a fresh machine directly from an image you've got there, you could do so. And then if you want to then um, boot from, say, for example, an external SAM, you can boot directly from a volume. So I'm just going to say boot from image from here. There's going to be a list of uh, images that I want to boot from. Now, I've got two images available to me. So these images are being directly served by Glance, the image repository service. Now, um, I'm going to select the Cirrus one. It is based on Ubuntu, but this is my local laptop, and if I choose RHEL, it's going to take a little while to load because it's uh, at uh, 1.2 gigabytes. This one's 12 megabytes. So I'm select I want to boot a Cirrus image. There's a few other tabs that I've got there. Um, a key pair, so very similar again to Amazon. You'll, you'll, you know, if you're familiar with Amazon, adopting OpenStack becomes very easy. We have the idea of uh, key pairs, where um, you won't necessarily know the root password of your image. That makes images, of course, very portable, but to actually get root access and, that, and, and direct access into these virtual machines, what typically happens is that Nova will inject your key pair so that you can just uh, secure a shell directly onto your instance without requiring a password, and then you can change the root password to whatever you want it to be. Uh, admin password, if you want to override the password, of course. And then we've got the security groups. We'll, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but security groups is basically the firewall rules that you want to assign to your virtual machine or your instance. Uh, so you can have multiple different security groups. Maybe you've got one for uh, databases in which you'll only open up ports that are corresponding for, for the database, then you may have one for your web servers, so maybe you only open up AT and 443, etc. So I'm just got the default group there. Networking, you know, which network do I want to sign? And uh, we'll go into networks in a lot more detail as well if, if you want to. But I'm just going to say I, I, I've only got one network that I've defined, and I want to attach that network to my instance. And then we've got this post creation. Now, um, post creation is essentially where you can customize your, your image to come up with whatever you want it to be. An example here would be maybe you, you run a Puppet when your instance comes up, and you may want to define uh, an environment variable that will be used by Puppet to say, I want this server to come up as uh, a MySQL server or a Postgres server. And you put that in there, and when the instance starts up, just like Amazon and Rackspace, it actually contacts a metadata service to, to get this information. So you, you can pretty much put whatever you want in here. It could be a bash script, it could be any executable script that your platform can, uh, can run, but uh, that just allows you to customize your, uh, your machine. Uh, so you can uh, input a uh, puppet manifest on that? Um, if, for example, your image is already set up to boot with, uh, with Puppet on boot and actually consume environment variables, then yeah, for sure. But this, uh, I mean, I guess the easiest way of thinking about this is as soon as your instance starts up, if you've set it to use the metadata service, it will execute whatever's in that, uh, that box. So if it's a bash script, it'll just execute the bash script. So what's happening now is um, Nova will receive that request to start this, this instance. It will then schedule that instance. So if you've got, say, a thousand hypervisors, it will choose which one to deploy your instance on top of. And then it's going to go into this process called spawning. Now spawning is basically setting up the environment on the hypervisor, pulling that image out of glance, putting it on that local hypervisor, and getting it started up. So it's going to take a little while on my laptop, so we'll leave, we'll leave that spawning for the time being. Um, whilst that's doing that, let's have a quick look at the uh, security groups. So we've got this, uh, this tab here, security groups, and I've just got one called default. And we can go in and we can edit the rules. Now, by default, OpenStack actually pretty much rejects anything going uh, ingress into a virtual machine or an instance. Okay? It, it literally rejects everything. Now, this is also one of the major stumbling blocks of, of when people are trying to set up and configure OpenStack. They're trying, you know, they think they've got all their networking working, cor working correctly, and uh, they can't ping their instance, they can't secure a shell into their instance. This is because the security group rules are actually rejecting it. So, it's very important that you look into the security group rules when you are configuring uh, your OpenStack environment. 
So all I've done here is I've basically said um, on both IPv4 and IPv6, allow anything outbound. Then inbound, I allow anything based on ICMP, so I can ping my instance, and then anything coming in on port 22 from any direction. Okay. Now, these firewall rules don't get implemented within the instance. This is based, this is done by the network implementation. So, open vSwitch uh, in, in conjunction with IP tables actually rejects or, or allows these, uh, these security rules. So let's see how our instance is doing. Right, so it's now gone to active. That machine is now booting. So I can go ahead, click on that machine. I can view various different information, the IP addresses that it's been assigned, the security groups, or I can go directly, I can view console log. So I can see, has it booted up? Is it currently locked on something? Right, it may be timing out, waiting for a DHCP lease, or maybe it's just hung. You know, maybe it's a kernel panic or something. Or even better, you can go directly to the console. So you can actually view the VNC console of your instance. Now this is obviously very handy if you're trying to play around with some of the networking. Maybe some of the networking isn't working. So this machine is now running. Um, I don't have internet access on my laptop, so I can't really show you um, that the, the network is, is working. Um, but one of the things to show you is we talked about this concept of uh, Neutron being able to define networks for your instances to consume. Now this brings us on to the topic of tenant networks. So this is a brand new sort of concept within, uh, within the cloud um, environment where you as a user can define your own private virtual networks that don't necessarily see the outside world. Okay, These are just sort of implemented by networking technology like Open vSwitch. So you can have a number of instances that have a networking card and can communicate with other instances within the project, but don't actually exist in the real world. Okay. Now, this is the private network. I, I show you this diagram as it makes it a lot easier to sort of explain. This is the private network that I assigned to my instance, and you can see that my instance there has an IP address of 30.0.0.2. Okay. Within then OpenStack, you can define an external network which does really exist. And then you can create a virtual router which connects this private network directly to the external network. Okay? So you can't connect into that virtual machine, but that machine can connect out. Now, um, have you guys heard of the concept of floating IPs uh, or elastic IPs in an Amazon world? So um, floating IPs or elastic IPs basically um, are IP addresses that listen on the external network and actually route traffic directly to a tenant network, which means you don't actually, um, this machine never really needs to, to listen on a publicly facing network, everything just gets routed, routed over. So what we can do here is we can go back into our instances and we can then um, apply a floating, associated floating IP address. So we can see that we've got this network 192.168.122.201, which is just a randomly assigned network, and for those of you that are familiar with Libvirt networking, you'll know this, this sort of range. I will then assign this IP address to my, uh, my, my, my internal instance. I can hit associate there. It's now associated that, uh, that one there. What I can do, um, excuse me, Uh, if my networking is working correctly, I should then be able to access that network because it, it routes through, which I looks like I can. Make that bigger. And you can see that I'm actually now connected directly into my instances running over an open stack um, over a secure shell because I've exposed it to using a floating IP address. So this is just my uh, my Cirrus machine, and it'll only ever see this uh, this internal tenant network. It doesn't actually see the outside world. These floating IPs basically use NAT to go from the external network via what we call the L3 agent to NAT onto this network. I can appreciate that was uh, a pretty quick overview of uh, OpenStack networking because it's uh, a whole 
complex topic which we could uh, we could spend hours talking about. But uh, are there any questions on that or on open stack in, in general? What you've seen? Yeah. yeah I could want, um, how about uh, keeping up the you know core uh, components of mm -hmm. open stack yeah. with have high availability? So yeah. you do you, can you have uh, multiple uh, horizon panels? Yeah. Uh, so. Or there is also, as far as I remember, there is a database on the meet and can yeah. you like uh, set up that, uh, that link, uh, for example, if it can fail over or something, or being, you know, HA. Okay, so um, the question was, how would you make sure that the core OpenStack components themselves, so not being concerned about the virtual machines or anything, how would you keep the individual components highly available? And you know, the associated underlying components, such as the database and the message bus, how do you make those highly available? So, um, every OpenStack component has a RESTful API. This is basically how you as a client or the Horizon dashboard communicates with the services. These are stateless, are shared nothing, and are very fault tolerant. So, to make these seem highly available, you can just continue to add more of the same service um, across multiple different nodes and actually load balance across them. Um, so in terms of high availability, it's not necessarily highly available in terms of running a service to keep them up. Of course, you can do that with something like Pacemaker or, or, or CoralSync, um, but having more of the same instance because it's shared nothing and, uh, and, and scale out um, gives you this, uh, this concept of, of high availability. Um, then you've got things like the database. So um, there are plenty of database high availability options. In OpenStack, all of the, um, the sort of runtime data is actually stored in a SQL database. So, um, you know, likes of uh, MySQL, Postgres. Um, so there are plenty of per database type app, um, configurations, such as Galera, uh, that you can use for high or active active uh, MySQL. So you can do something like have multi-master. Uh, and then for the message bus, very similar. There's, there's lots of choices for the message bus. So OpenStack uses a message bus to uh, share some of the communication between all of the underlying components. Um, there's, depending on your implementation, you can have both an active-active, multi-master, or even an active-passive configuration, depending on the type of message broker that you do use. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, performance of Elastic IP? How many Packet per seconds you can push through the yeah. proxy map uh, or the yeah. virtual machines. Uh, right, so that actually takes us into another conversation, right? Because um, that uh, floating IP um, is based on the L3 agent, which is technically a single point of failure with an open stack. Um, so you are sort of limited all of your ingoing and outgoing traffic that isn't on the tenant network directly, so between instances. That's all being channeled through one single um, interface. Okay, yeah, you can bond it or you can use you know, LACP or whatever you want to do, but it's still only going to be going through a single point of failure. So there are alternatives. Um, you can use what we call provider networks as an alternative uh, to using uh, this floating IP concept, which actually has um, exposes lots of these uh, or exposes both uh, exposes this instance directly onto this external network so that you bypass this virtual router that sits in the middle which is that single point of failure um, so you, you can actually bypass that but again, again the, the, like I said I, I can't quote exact figures for you know, packets per second but it's a case of the limitation is going to be the, ca the capacity of that system that you're channeling every link through what is your technology to I'm sorry? Uh, uh, I don't uh, hear uh, how to call this technology to bypass this proxy. Oh, provider networks. Provider, provider networks, yeah. So okay. you basically define um, this external network to be available to all of your hypervisors. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of using this NAT technology to get from the external yeah. to the inter internal networks. Isn't VXLAN bypassing this? Uh, no, so um, so VXLAN and things like GRE or even VLANs are technologies used to isolate these networks from one another because you may find that you've got, say, I don't know, a thousand customers and if every single one wants their own network or set of networks, you have to have a way of isolating these whilst maybe sharing the same, um, you know, the same switches. 
think I understand correctly, you have to, for example, put the Cisco S on the front, and then uh, bypass this VLAN from Cisco S to the virtual machine itself. That, that's, that's, that's a possibility. So we're talking. That's um, going in, going more into um, the different types of implementation you can have with Neutron. You can you can certainly do that if you want to use some of the Cisco technology to actually create these tenant networks. That's absolutely a possibility. But I'm more talking about the way that we do it on um, or by default in the Red Hat OpenStack distribution. That's using Open vSwitch. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You could use a technology like that. It's all about how do you create these virtual networks and attach them directly into your virtual machines. We use Open vSwitch here. You, there's plenty of other technologies that can do this. Anything else? I guess we should. Uh, sorry. Okay, so I mean, performance is sort of relative, right? It all depends on you know what type of instance you're using and what that's backed by. But in terms of actually deploying, configuring a Hadoop infrastructure, there's a couple of ways of doing it. Where you know you could do it all manually, which would take a lot of time. Um, you can use something like Heat, so you can de you can determine all the different instances that you want and how you actually scale them out using Heat. Um, or you can just use Savannah. So as I mentioned, Savannah is um, a new incubating OpenStack component which actually manages and configures the deployment of um, OpenStack instances that represent Hadoop machines. So this is coming in the next release of OpenStack. Um, so you can have a play around with it now. There are packages available for it. So I, I, I suggest you look into Savannah. When it comes for uh, some big production uh, deployments of OpenStack, so for example, the, the, the that was that you mentioned uh, on the start of the presentation that the NASA and uh, Rackspace are are using, and their yeah. package is based on OpenStack. Yeah. Could you, uh, could you mention some more? Yeah. So um, this so, so uh, Rackspace is an enormous um, OpenStack user. Um, their public cloud is all now based on OpenStack. So if you go to, to Rackspace's public cloud and you consume resources there, you are you are actually using OpenStack. And a lot of the OpenStack APIs are exposed directly to you. So if you've got scripts and you want to, to code against the API. Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm asking about you know, some companies that are using OpenStack. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, telling people's, yeah, okay, we use OpenStack in our so yeah. More companies. Yeah. So um, there's a whole list on OpenStack.org. Um, one of the biggest ones to, that are, you know, sort of a reference and, and publicly speak about this is CERN in Switzerland. You know, they have uh, tens of thousands of nodes all running on OpenStack for their uh, their scientific research, and then they utilize it uh, utilize it pretty well. But uh, yeah, OpenStack.org. They've got a whole list of customers that are using OpenStack and are happy to, you know, say that they're using it and the sort of sizes that they're actually deploying. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how how do you uh, help with scaling out, not scaling up? If I have an application in Shelly on the one server with the database on it, yeah. Uh, how OpenStack helps me as a developer to scale out? Uh, yeah. I assume that your uh, database as a service uh, component. In the future release, yeah, we'll help with it. That can certainly help, but we're really talking about the fundamental <coughs> way in which applications are written. So rather than it being a self-contained application, which if you want more throughput, you have to add more resources to it, and you know that, that's a continual process. OpenStack itself doesn't help you turn that application into one that can scale out. It simply provides the perfect platform for the application after it's been. Recoded. Okay, so what, how are you different uh, from Amazon? This is the actually, same. Actually, to it, add yeah, the other uh, it's, DB instance to scale out. The oh, OpenStack is modeled on 
um, Amazon, but it allows you as a user to have that same components and those, that same flexibility and agility that Amazon gives you behind your own corporate firewall. <coughs> so you don't have to take your card to Amazon and, and pay them, you can build the same infrastructure in-house. Okay. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's so, right in the same. Okay, and but will this database service uh, component will help with scale out, scaling out the application which needs more DB uh, rights, DB yeah. DB throughput, yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. So it's master to master, master master. Uh, yeah, there is. This I don't need to care about anything. Yeah. So again, OpenStack is sort of the the framework on how these sorts of things should work, and then it relies on underlying plugins and drivers. So I think the reference architecture at the moment is is a, is a MySQL server mm -hmm. uh, that actually you can scale out automatically using that. But in the future, the likes of say MongoDB. Um, they could write a driver for um, uh, Trove, the, the database as a service, and have that automatically scale out and, and have the, uh, the database as a service component manage that replication sets and, uh, and how that scales out. So yeah, absolutely. But the fundamental thing is the application itself. Okay, thank you very much.